go. That should be coming through now. Excellent. Hello, and welcome to my game design stream. So for those of you who are new here, I'm doing a weekly game design screen stream. As you see, I start with a blank piece of paper over here. Uh, don't have any inspirations or anything that I'm starting from. Just going to start with whatever word pops into my head. I'm going to create a mind map from that first word. Mind map is a way of creating a brainstorm to really blow out ideas, come up with a bunch of really creative stuff. And from the ideas that come from the mind map, we're going to work through and come up with a game design concept. I mostly work with board game design, but a lot of this stuff could be tweaked to work in a digital format because at this early stage of ideation, things aren't really determined. Uh, I talk a little bit about pot potential components, doing a board, doing cards. So I come at it from a board game design perspective, but won't necessarily end up as a board game. Just like to come up with some creative ideas. So I'm actually headed to PAX East tomorrow, <laughs> flying out tomorrow. I've been jamming hard on a lot of the board game designs that I'm hoping to bring with me, stuff that I'm looking to pitch and play test. So I was a little nervous sitting down and moving away from that and doing a brainstorm that's completely unrelated to PAX. But I find that, and one of the reasons that I encourage other people to do this activity as well, is that I believe that just doing it, getting your juices flowing, stepping away from things that might be frustrating or you might be stuck on, really helps to just open up your brain for avenues of new creativity. And it's relaxing too, you know, there's not a lot of stress put on this activity. We're not looking to make the next great American game or the next top 100 BGG game. It's all about just pushing the boundaries of ideas, coming up with new stuff and stuff that hasn't really been seen before. Or maybe it's completely generic and just like, oh, this is a cube pusher worker placement game that just happens to be about centipedes instead of trains. So with that being said, tweak my notebook right here so we can get a good angle on this. And now we're going to come up with the starting point for the game. So one of the, the most exciting and nerve wracking things about this stream is literally no preparation. I'm not coming into it with any ideas. I'm not starting from anything. Whatever word pops into my head or is suggested first on stream, I'm going to work from that. Um, so what have I been working on recently? I'm working on a game called What to Eat After the Apocalypse, where you have your character, you're trying not to starve to death, but everything you eat is trying to kill you. So I do have food on the brain. I've also been thinking a lot about my abandon all artichokes card, the potato. I like potatoes, so... <laughs> hey James, great to see you. Yes, it's very much like improv. This is improv game design right here. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you ask the audience. Yeah, I mean, if you have anything to suggest, then I will start from that. But if no one... <laughs> hey, thanks so much for tuning in. If no one says anything, I'm gonna write down potato, because... I like potatoes, and that's what's in my brain right now. Pot potato. What's taters, precious? All right, potato. Uh, so dirt, first of all, when I think about potatoes, potatoes grow in the dirt. Some other things that come to mind are soil, rocks, Loam. I like the word loam, which also makes me think of 
foam and the ocean. Potatoes are a starch, right? The starch, they're very starchy, have a lot of carbohydrates. It's also a root and a vegetable. <laughs> it's really funny actually working on a food game where I'm trying to categorize things as fruits and vegetables. You'd be very surprised the categorizations of some of your favorite foods. For example, you might know that a tomato is technically categorized as a fruit. An artichoke, I learned, is neither a fruit nor a vegetable, it is actually a bud. So it is a pre-flower. Uh, what else is an interesting one? I think eggplant is a fruit. Uh, yeah, but I'm pretty sure that a potato is actually a vegetable. And in fact, it is something that I, I cling to when I eat french fries because, you know, a potato, a, a plate of french fries, if you think about it, is basically a salad. So I'm going to put salad up here. James says, I run workshops where I force people to create games from scratch in under an hour and then swap their designs around for playtesting. I always give them a theme to start sparking some ideas. That is super intense. I've done workshops. I did an hour long one where I started from a theme. Some people did really great with it. Some people struggled a lot. I've tried with playtesting. I usually do two hours. Um, but an hour is a really great amount of time. And I'd like to work, I'd like to hear a little bit more actually about your format for that because that's something that people are super excited about. It's like make a game in an hour and being able to test the other designs. I think play testing is one of the most important parts of game design, which we will not get yet, get to yet for the game that we're creating today because we're just conceptualizing it, which is a little easier because it doesn't have to work. <laughs> <laughs> We're just trying to come up with something creative here. Um, but it's an important point to point out that playtesting is a very important part of the process. All right, starch, bread. So you think of bread, uh, toast. Um, shoot, what is I am bread? I am bread. I think that's the game where you play where you play as a slice of bread, trying to navigate itself around the kitchen. I'm bread, I'll just do that as one word. Toast, kitchen, cooking. <laughs> I've noticed in this, I like food. I like food games. I tend to gravitate a little bit towards food type stuff, but I'm trying to make not all my games be about food and cooking, so. Kitchen, I like that though. Uh, coming back down here, slide this up a little bit to our soil and rocks. Um, this is tying into an idea of growing potatoes. So garden and plants. I've noticed from this live ideation of game ideas that often what's most compelling to people is like a concept centered around emotion, experience, or movement. So last week we did one called Fashion Party where you were trying to potentially in a roll and write format, you're trying to get all sorts of different clothes and put on the best outfit for an event that would be revealed. You're trying to be the most fashionable without being pretentious. So this, the, the verb action there was a uh, collection, getting dressed and this emotion of pretentiousness. So we're talking about garden, uh, a garden and plants. So that's really making me think about growth. Game won't necessarily be about plants physically growing, but this conceptual experience is like, what does it mean to grow? What does it mean to start from something small, from a seed, either a plant or an idea, and to increase in size, stature, complexity from the seed? Right here, we have some things about food. 
roots. I like roots. I like the idea of roots as a system. Uh, interlocking. And interconnecting. Uh, I like the idea of growth and dirt. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, definitely send me an email about the, the playtesting thing. So that's something I'm working on is improving my live playtest workshops. I want to do something on stream too. Once this gets a little more established, do like a live game design stream maybe work in like tabletop simulator to be able to play test people's games live because that would be super sweet. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here from some of these ideas of growing roots through the dirt. We might come back to the brainstorm here and go in a different direction. I think that's one of the most exciting things that I'm looking to push when I'm doing this live is don't get too tied down to a particular idea. For example, the stream we did last week, we were using clear, or our idea was to use clear cards, like in Gloom or in Mystic Veil, vale, where you stacked your outfits. But very quickly pivoted from that to more of a roll and write um, presentation. So let us go to the next page and work with our idea of roots. So right off the bat, I'm having this idea of Kadama or even in Then We Died with a non-linear, like having a bunch of cards, And this isn't a determined thing. This is just what I'm envisioning based on our brainstorm of roots. So instead of like in, I'm just going to write Kadama up here as an inspiration. Instead of Kadama where you have, you're building a tree and you have different branches coming off in different directions with bugs and flowers and leaves on there. I'm thinking of this just like really dark, gritty. <laughs> This is like a gritty version. This is like the, um, oh, gritty reboot. So like Batman, right, with a gritty reboot, but this is like the Kadama gritty reboot. Instead of this like beautiful tree, we're doing this like dark root system. So these roots, you're going to lay down root cards that have little nexuses or nexi. Uh, let me see if that's coming through. Looks pretty good. Have little nexuses that stretch out um, all across the cards in a non-linear fashion. So roots delving through the earth. We're thinking of this dark, dark, potentially evil theme. Uh, so the roots delve too deep. Oh, I forget what the exact quote is. Like I, uh, I delve too long and too deep. So this idea of, I'm gonna draw a little demon here. Is that coming through? Yeah, a little mad. She's mad. I'm so mad and I'm a demon. I have a, a forked tail. I forget what demons look like. I have hands and a spear. <laughs> Excellent. So the idea now, they could be double-sided cards. So for going in this demon like delving direction, and so we had originally started out with potato <laughs> as our inspiration, came to this idea of roots going down. And it kind of works with potato too, because when you have, I don't know if you've grown potatoes before, 
but they go like you plant the whole potato under the ground from the eyes um new roots sprout, uh, sprout out of that and then you have the nodes like that you have nodes you can make a note of that you have the nodes growing off of the roots and then stalks growing up for the leaves grows new potatoes but maybe they're not roots exactly maybe it's more of tunnels uh, and we had come up with this idea of roots going out in different directions but maybe we start from a plane which is our starting tunnel and come down here to either side so our idea is evolving now, starting from roots and going into tunnels. And we have this idea of non-linear, so all of the cards, instead of being in a static grid format, push this up so you can see a little better. I think I gotta adjust this a little bit. It should be better. Now we have our cards, happy little cards. Where each one is going to have like a entry point, uh, perhaps several connection points, and tunnels coming out. So from this idea of the roots kind of being all chaotic, I'm starting to evolve the potential of this game into more of a tunneling system. And we're tunneling downwards into the earth. Tunneling into earth. And coming across things. Have this idea of a of demons. So maybe the deeper you delve, like the worst creatures that you come across. And maybe we have double-sided cards. So on one side of a card, I might have some tunnels coming off, flip the card over, and then it will reveal, um, maybe I've come to like a, a node that has some enemies in here. I'm not going to draw them out right now, I'm just going to mark them as X's. So delving deeper have this idea of creating an interlocking tunnel network. Double-sided cards, when we put down the cards, we create the tunnel. I'm gonna make a note of that over in our document here. For now, I'm gonna call it the tunneling game. Again, we're not wedded to this idea at all. It might go in a completely different direction. But we have this idea of double-sided cards with demons. And if we're, we have this idea of time passing and things getting worse as the cards go down, this immediately triggers an idea of different resource piles of the different cards. We'll say three, because three is a good number. So this is... <laughs> light, medium, and heavy demons. And we're picking, start out with a light one, put those cards down. I'm going to zoom back here to think about what might this, the tableau, look like after a few turns of gameplay. So perhaps we lay down a bunch of cards such as this. The different decks could mark out the different phases over time. So once all the light cards are gone, the first phase is done. And it's an interesting idea, actually. So as the cards are laid down, if we're going, if all the cards have to go in a downward motion, we're going to have all the cards out towards the edges be on top of the pile. So at this point, we have a, a motion for a phase of the game or for a game loop. Whereas the, there's the laying down of the cards to create this pattern and then like 
laying them down like this and then in a reverse motion flipping over the cards and having some sort of a re resolution. So we've created the pattern like this and recreate the pattern down here. It's going to be resolved in a reverse manner. So for the cards that are now on the top of the other cards, they will be flipped over. Revealing a very mad demon with X eyes. And we would potentially resolve conflict. All right, so that's the first direction that we kind of naturally went, went into with this concept of the game. Started with potato, went down a rabbit hole, if you will of roots, following those roots, digging down through the ground, came up with an idea, what if they weren't roots, they were tunnels, and you were tunneling down through the earth to create this network of tunnels, maybe unearthing demons as you went along, and then fighting against these demons. So where have all these ideas come from? This idea of tunneling down and bumping up against enemies is not uncommon. Often when you're brainstorming game ideas, the, some of the first things you come across are stereotypes, things that have been done before, things that are just known in the universe. For example, this idea of demons in a network of caves. My friend Chris is working on a game called Heroes Beware, where the, the demons are actually the, the good people and the heroes are the ones coming into their cave and messing stuff up. So let's take a step back here and think, what if they're not demons? So once you come up with your original idea, before you get too attached to it, I like to challenge them, some of the assumptions that I've made through the ideation process. So what if not demons? And we can dig back through some of the, the conceptualization that we had in the beginning. You're thinking about dirt, loam, the kinds of things that like to live in the earth or the dirt. So like a earthworm. Or actual roots. Considering roots to be living active things like the plant could be the participant sending out these feelers down into the earth um, beetles are another thing that lives underground ants i like this idea of an ant farm insect game under the earth it's not a theme that I've played before. I'm sure there's beetle ant games out there. Uh, but I think at least in the, if you think of video games and tabletop games, this idea of like fighting and demon enemies, I feel is a little more common. So right now this idea of still potentially battling factions or maybe cooperative factions of both plants and insects digging in, digging around in the dirt and doing different things. Like that's pretty interesting and exciting. So let's flip to a new page. Put this in our notes, tunneling game. I still like the idea of movement down through the dirt or down through the earth, but maybe not with demons. So through the dirt, through the earth, plants and insects, tunneling, tunneling, excellent. All right. So mechanically, there's a couple of different directions that you could go. You could have tokens, you could have a roll and write sort of a, if, if we're focusing on board games here, you could have a roll and write 
um, similar to Railroad Inc., where you're making the paths. You can have cards, as I was talking about, as I was demonstrating with the overlapping rectangles idea. It could be rectangle cards, square cards, circular cards. I don't want to get too caught up right now in the form factor of it, so let's picture without worrying too much about the individual components, what the whole state might look like. So I like this idea of different plants um, having two different sides plants here um, yeah one with big leaves and they have roots coming down into the earth and maybe different types of plants have different types of roots maybe the roots compete against each other or maybe they're working together and these roots are creating a network Maybe the roots are blockers. So if I'm playing an insect, also trying to make my little worm tunnel here. Ooh. Actually, ooh, this is when we need colors. Get out my purple, purple marker for the worm tunnels. On my worm or perhaps several worms trying to tunnel through the dirt here. And maybe I have a ant as well, or an ant colony trying to tunnel here. Again, we haven't settled yet on whether it's going to be competitive or cooperative, so we could say maybe cooperative or um, com competitive, co competitive, cooperative, cooperative where we share tunnels, where everyone shares tunnels. So the plants, when the roots come down, it loosens up the soil and makes it easier for things to, to tunnel. Share tunnels or competitive competitive, at least where the plants, where the roots coming down through the dirt block the tunnels. Roots block tunnels. Cooperative, share tunnels, competitive, roots block tunnels. Ooh. Excellent. So I talked about it being nonlinear and having cards that you laid down. But now mm, I have another idea for the way the layout of this might work. Okay, if you've ever played the old game Labyrinth, not the movie version of Labyrinth or Magic Labyrinth, which I believe has the magnet. So there's a couple of other um, Labyrinth games. But this one is Labyrinth. It was made like oh, 20 or 25 years ago. The board has built in uh, tokens that are attached to the board. And then you put a bunch of other tokens that can slide down certain channels. And you're rearranging the tunnels or the labyrinth by pushing these tiles. So maybe instead of a chaotic nonlinear format, we have our board here. And this is a really cool mechanic. I don't know if they have a patent on it or just if it's too hard to create or other people just haven't felt the need to make another game around this or if they would be too similar to the original Labyrinth. But this idea of some static tiles, it, it's a little hard to explain without visualizing. So I'm going to draw it out here. So you have your, your, your tiles that are affixed to the board and also on the, yeah, all the ones with X's are stuck down so they can't move when you push anything into them, but also just sat on top of the board of the same size and they all have rounded edges. 
are a bunch of other tiles. And they're arranged in rows such that if you push down one side, you'll put another tile into the one side, push it down, a tile will pop off the end, and now this tile will take its space. So you can rearrange the whole shape of the labyrinth with how you slide the tiles back and forth. Ooh. How cool. Interesting. I, this is like, I don't know if the licensed versions, if they just haven't re-upped or something. Cause I've been surprised. I had to buy the game. I love the game. I had to buy it off of Amazon and I'm surprised that I haven't seen it in more stores that sell Ravensburger games. Uh, or maybe it's something that's coming back. So I would love to see more things with this kind of creative, um, layout or things. It's just so satisfying to rearrange the whole puzzle basically by sliding certain pieces. And if you have a very graphical mind, you can kind of uh, figure out what it will look like after things have been rearranged. But if you don't, you're kind of just chaos, like pushing. It's like, oh, I did not expect, oh, I thought this was going to connect. Oh, it's not connecting anymore. And that's sad. Or potentially this uh, root root slash bug sliding game. Maybe it could be pitched to Ravensburger. So maybe they have this original concept. Maybe they're looking for new ideas to work with their original labyrinth style of games. So when you're looking at coming up with ideas, again, this is all about ideation. We're not just going too productized in this particular stream. But whenever I'm coming up with ideas, I, I like to think a little bit about, you know, how is this going to be a board game? Would this be better as a digital game? Who might be interested in this? Uh, is this something that I might want to move forward with? So yeah, let's delve a little bit more into this labyrinth idea. So instead of in labyrinth, you are in a labyrinth, obviously. You're playing as wizards, I believe, going around collecting treasure uh, and different tokens, and the labyrinth is constantly rearranging itself. But in this version, again, step back for a second from the product form factor and just look like what a map might look like. So, do, 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 do. let me draw out my paths here. So maybe you have one coming in here, coming down like that. And then you have, and these are all gonna be the bug tunnels. Um, this would be really cool because you can play as little bugs. One person could be an ant and have a little tiny bug meeples. You could have an ant and an earthworm a beetle, and maybe like a mouse. <laughs> a mouse, sure. We won't worry too much about scale for this, for this exercise. So you have these different tunnels. And maybe this one comes down like this. Maybe we have a cross connector here. But this is like this. Some of them are elbow shaped. They're a little trickier to get them to connect. We have ones like that. Got a T shape up here uh, and just some straight. Uh, let's put another cross piece in there. All right, so with our grid that we have going on here, so we come, <laughs> come back around from this first from potatoes, then to the idea of roots coming out, dabbled a little bit with demons, and now we're basically making a bug version of Labyrinth. I love that Labyrinth is big in Europe. That's actually where I played it for the first time. I played it in Norway about 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, super fun. Had a lot of fun playing it. I think 
it's a pretty casual game. It's you do have some control over how you're moving the pieces, but it's pretty random whether you're going to successfully get your things and things can line up, right? Like you could you're flipping over the cards randomly to decide which treasure you're going to go after next and you can get super lucky with like oh there's the vial and there's the genie and there's the gem it's like oh i win the game so if we're going in this direction and again this is a thought exercise so the great thing about thought exercises we don't have to worry about licenses we're just coming up with ideas here so what if we're going to make a bug version of labyrinth uh, but maybe give a little more control over give a little more control and choice and make a little more complex version of labyrinth with bugs with some more interesting choices in here so how about set collection set collection oh my gosh also i have to write simiant down because this is really getting my cement synapses firing right now. I, I just visually see, I don't know if you ever played Simeon, it's a pretty old game, but I see the little food pellets, those little green circles that represent the food, uh, the little ants digging down, and if you dug down far enough, you might connect to the red ant, the evil red ant palace. Um, conflict, which brings a good conflict question. Do we want to have fighting? Do we want to have battling? If you go into a space with another character, do we want an option to interact with them, mess them up, or maybe help them? Maybe there can be an element of trading. I like that. Trading. One thing I will say, uh, you had mentioned, James, that the labyrinth is big in Europe. A lot of, if you dig into the history of Euro games versus more American games, a lot of the Euro games don't have a lot of negative interaction. A lot of them don't necessarily have a lot of interaction at all. They don't have a lot of conflict. So if we're going for more of a Euro style game, we might have something where you land on the same space and you trade with someone or you get to, you each get to have an action. Whereas if we're going more American or some people might say Ameritrash game style, you might have the two pieces land on a square together and they fight, right? Like you each, you flip over a card, maybe the cards that you're collecting are double use and they have some numbers on them, whoever is the high, like a war style, like very simple, you know? Whoever's the highest number, has to give the other person a resource. So two different like branching directions that we could go with this, this design. I'm gonna say trading for now. I've been talking a little bit in the past streams about how there's a lot of games that focus on combat um, and I'm interested in potentially making a conflict combat game at some point, but for the time being, I want to delve into other styles of gameplay. So let's say if you, I'm going to make the notes over in our doc here. Um, I'm just going to put the demon stuff down on the bottom for now and work on some of the notes we've been coming up with. Excuse me while I drink. I get very thirsty. I hope you're enjoying the unicorn. Trading fungus and ape. Yes, exactly. <laughs> hey, Senor Bob, great to see you. Exactly, right? Okay, so we are, if you're just joining us here, we have a labyrinth style, uh, I'm gonna say tile sliding game, uh, themed on tunnels, roots and insects push the tiles to rearrange the insect tunnels set collection with um, things you'd find underground so we had mentioned here fung fungus fungi 
fungi, <laughs> fungi and aphids and um, I guess seeds, anti seeds. I don't know what they eat underground. We will say seeds for now. So your it's got sec collection in this thing with a trading element. If you land on a space with another insect, you can trade, uh, I'm gonna say equal numbers of cards. Trading is a really interesting mechanic. I've been playing around with it with my Split the Loot game. I'm really excited as a game designer right now with this concept of uh, forced or constrained trading. So historically, there's been a lot of Catan, you look at Catan, a lot of freeform trading, a lot of, you know, I'll trade you, does anyone want sheep? You know, I want to, I want to get some wood, like will you trade sheep for wood? It's like, oh, I don't really want to do that. Like, oh, what if I throw in a, a brick? You know, will you give me the wood? There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of negotiation. Um, and, and usually it's bad. So it's really hard to know the absolute economics of trading. And if you're just like, if you really know the math of the game really well, you can make make sure that all of your own trades are optimal and other trades are suboptimal. But I love trading as a concept um, with making strategic choices about, this isn't so useful to me right in this moment, but this is what I need right now, and I'm willing to give up this thing. So I like it as a mechanic, but I like the idea of constraining it so you're not likely to screw yourself up. So having it constrained, I'm gonna draw out my, ooh, can I draw an ant? Oh my gosh, yes. Ante! Here's Ante, probably six legs. Um, and here's a wor wormula, earth wormula. It's important to name your characters as you're doing brainstorm. It's very mechanical. Auntie and Wormula are on a space together. We'll blow up the art here. Um, trade cards one for one. <laughs> and I kind of like I kind of like a hidden element to it too, right? Because there's, part of this is about speeding up the action of a game. So if you're kind of like, oh, I want this, like, do you want this? What if I offer you this? You can really grind the game to a halt. So I kind of like the idea of hidden trades. And maybe as you're going around the board, collecting some of these fungi and aphids and things. Ooh, that, that, that's a cool idea too. If you have, uh, I'm gonna mark it as stars here. If you have nodes for the items. So instead of, um, instead of like going in the traditional labyrinth board where you see there's a gem, everyone knows there's a gem there. If you're going towards it, you kind of know that someone's going for the gem. You just go to these shifting nodes and maybe a node, a certain node like might have an aphid or a seed. So there's partial information. And with some partial info, you can do a little bit of bluffing, right? So like, oh, I'm going to do a trade with you. I'm going to trade these two cards. And the person decides then without seeing the cards, like, am I going to do a trade or not? So maybe you just have a bunch of stuff in your hand that you definitely don't want. So you're like, I'm willing to take gamble. Um, it's got that push your luck aspect to it that I really like. Aspect. All right, how are we doing on time here? Got about up to 10 minutes left. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, I'm headed to PAX East in a couple of days. I've been jamming hard on a lot of prototypes that really need to get done. So I'm not gonna take too much longer on here, but I do want to tie all these pieces together and come up with a concept that is ready for prototyping. So I haven't yet moved any of these brainstormed game concepts to prototypes, but as I tweak my setup a little bit, it's something that I want to do in the future, actually take these ideas and prototype it. I actually have a copy of Labyrinth, so mocking something like this up would 
be pretty straightforward. So that would be something I'd be interested in trying. Talking of insects in tunnels, there's Bruno Cathala's Mic Micropolis, which doesn't have tile sliding or trading, but does have an emergent board. I'm going to make a note of that. Micropolis. Oh man, I haven't, the name sounds familiar. I haven't taken a close look at it. I think it's important speaking about ideation of game design ideas. As I'm doing this, especially doing it live, I start to think about the games that I've played, sometimes get a little bit worried about, is this too similar to a game? You know, this is such a cool idea. Someone must have done something like this before. There's too many demon games or too many insect games. I think it's good to have an awareness of the games out there. If you come up with something that's very simple and elegant, and it is like very similar to something that else that's come up before, you might have a little bit of tough time productize, productizing something. Uh, but if you start from an interesting creative idea and build out from there, chances are, even if a game has a similar theme, you're gonna make a unique game. So don't get too worried or too caught up about it. Ooh, I was working on a design that used the go fish mechanic. Uh, the caveat was that you might get a cursed item. I love this. I, <laughs> I don't know what it is about me as a game designer, but I really enjoy anything that's kind of, um, yeah, curse push your luck, uh, monkey paw, especially something that is, might be negative in a points way, uh, give you negative points or move you, like not necessarily move you closer to the winning of the game, but can give you a really powerful effect that if used wisely can overcome the negative point value of a thing. All right, so in summary, what do we have here for our tunneling game? You land on a space with another insect, you can trade equal number of cards. Line trading question mark. Make things go more quickly. Nodes instead of known items collected, uh, partial information. So a, a dual sided I like might be aphids or fungi. I just love fungi in general. I want like fungus, really cool fungus arts. Uh, if you play Magic the Gathering, I've been doing a lot of saprolings slash mushroom people recently and one of my favorite parts is just the art and the flavor of an army of funguses marching upon your opponents. Um, so I think this is a pretty strong direction that we have for this game. Tile sliding, connecting tunnels, maybe some using plant roots as a blockage. Your insect is navigating its way through the tunnels. Set collection of items. I guess right now the main question would be what is the set collection criteria? What is philosophically, what is set collection? This is a really interesting question because I think it's easy to lean a lot on the set collection stuff that's going, that's gone before. For Split the Loot, which is my forced, I, I just came up with the, uh, the idea of constrained trading and I really like that. So I'm going to use that term from now on. My constrained trading game where you have a hand of four cards, give two to your neighbors and then keep two in your own deck that you're building up. For the set collection, I use pretty traditional stuff. You know, it's like uh, the kinds of sets you would see in Sushi Go or Gonuts for Donuts, a lot of those more simple set collection games. It's like if you have the most of an item or if you have an, an escalating um, geometric curve, you know, where it starts out, if you have one, it's worth one points. If you have two, it's worth three points. 
uh, pairs is a very traditional set collection mechanic. Uh, negative sets, where the more of an item you get, the fewer points you get. So there's a lot of known space around set collection. What can we do that's a little bit unique for set collection? And part of how complex our set collection is going to be is how complex of a game do we want this to, to be? Do we want to have action cards that can trigger cascading effects? Do we want to keep things pretty simple and you're trying to get one of each item? We can think about this mechanically and also thematically. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe if I'm the ant, I want to get a bunch of aphids. So maybe each different um, player type is trying to get the matching type of items. That treads a little bit into asymmetrical characters, which can be a dangerous direction to go into and can be very tricky to do well. Um, but as I'm coming up with the stuff, I will make a brainstorm list. So we have each player collecting one type of item. Uh, you want variety. So you want to get one of each item. So instead of going very focused, you're going very broad. Another type of set collection is different items have different set collection criteria. So I'm just going to call that uh, traditional. <laughs> it's funny too, because it's like, how long has this type of set collection been around? I don't exactly know. Somebody who's been working on a history of game design, wink, wink, book, might know a little better than me how long set collection, as we know it, has been around. But I'm just gonna say traditional set collection. Um, ant lions. We're, we're back on sim ant now, right? Like when we talk about ant lions, this is where my head goes. Just, oh my gosh, which ones were the ant, ant lions? Those are one of the ones that were in the hole and you would like fall in the hole, right? Ant lions are great though. <laughs> ant lions were terrifying. I forget. It's been so long since I played Sim Ant. I just remember spiders and ant lions, like just seeing this giant thing coming to eat your face is very scary. Um, and maybe there is traps, right? Like this idea of thematic traps that fit into this tunneling game universe. Um, bug Labyrinth. <laughs> I love naming things. When I'm doing brainstorm, I try to not fall down the rabbit hole of naming things because I can get super caught up on that and forget to actually mechanically make the game. Uh, so I could spend a lot of time naming this game, but for now, we're just going to have it be Bug Labyrinth. We have some ideas of ways to gain points potentially through set collection. The last thing I think I'm interested to see is what is the win condition or end condition of this. There's again with that, there's a couple of different directions you can go into. You can have uh, someone chooses to end the game. Like maybe you're trying to get one of each item and then once you have made the collection, you can end the game and say like, hey, I've done it. Uh, that's kind of similar to the win condition for Abandoned All Artichokes. You know, you've collected a certain set of things. Very simple, you don't have to worry about counting up points. You can also go a certain number of rounds. Um, you can do a little more complex than just, just one of each item. 
and potentially a little less tricky to achieve is like due to a number of points. So you can cash in your points at a certain juncture in the game and have a point tracker like first to 30. Um, and at set made, first to 30, so on and so forth. <laughs> Avalanches? Like avalanching points? Oh, wait, was that from Simant? Was that like your thing could could collapse in upon itself? I'm, I'm gonna have to check. Avalanches, question mark? <gasps> <laughs> first to 30 points um yeah because that's the way it works in the original the set made is how it works in the original labyrinth is once you collect the certain number of things you actually you're revealing them as you collect them so you have your hand and you can collect several different items and once you get all of those items you put them down so it's very clear for other people to see how far along you are, which I think is a little bit, Labyrinth is a very casual game, but I think it's a little bit of an issue with that style of game because there isn't really a catch up mechanism. So, you know, if you have all the things, say like, oh, I have the things I need to win the game, everyone can kind of see that. And if you've gotten three and I've got zero over here, it can be a little bit <laughs> not as fun. <laughs> To move forward saying like well I guess unless I get all four of mine in one turn which I think you can do I think you can do multiple in turn I have to play labyrinth again I forget all of the specific rules of it but I think we'll just say for now end of the set made like if you collect one they have like five different things you have a fungus an aphid a seed uh, a rock and a cracker. <laughs> you could have some human stuff mixed in with the dirt as well. Once you've collected the set, you win the game. There's a trading element where you can trade back and forth with other players trying to get the cards you need to win. Avalanches in the tunnels. Oh, kind of a mm. tunnel destruction thing. I like that though. Tunnel destruction. Ooh, yeah. And this could be a way to give a little bit more control and player interaction. Uh, this something the original Labyrinth game doesn't have, but perhaps with a tile replacement or a tile covering, or even just uh, putting a token on top of one of the tiles, you could block a path. Um, I think it's important to be careful that you're not removing too many options from players but maybe if there's a bunch of nodes you can cover up a particular node that you know someone's going for maybe it's a temporary thing make sure people still have a lot of options but also give some more control for you to move towards your own win condition all right so let's do a little wrap up here Ooh, flipping a tile yes I'm gonna write that over here in the doc because uh, that's something cool like you have in the labyrinth game you have such a cool moving tile thing you're doing the sliding but I think there's potential for some of the really cool things like digging in there flipping a tile over double-sided tiles we had talked about double-sided cards earlier um, player interaction with player powers Maybe some of the cards that you're collecting from these nodes aren't actually points or part of the set collection, but they give you powers like tile flipping, um, either closing off a node or um, closing off a node, closing off a path releasing this spider or ant lion into the tunnels, eating all the bugs. I, I like a chaos element like that. Releasing ant lion into the tunnels. All bugs die. Cool. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think limiting the number of tiles, because you don't want, we're not in game development yet, so I'm not going to worry too much about, like, oh, how could players break the game? But even when you're building your first prototype, it's important to be, like, once you've designed a few games, you see some of these problems before you even start. It's like, if I give someone the power to cut someone off and stick them in this little tunnel segment, they will, some person is going to do that and some player is going to have a very bad game because they're just getting pushed around the map in this little, like, stuck tile, um, tile segment thing. All right, so to recap what we have done today in an hour in our brainstorming session, go back to the very beginning. So some of you who tuned in a little later might not have seen our mind map that we started the stream with. We started with the word potato. From potato, we branched out into dirt, root, had this idea of systems, circled a couple of the concepts were, that were the most interesting. So we had this idea of, instead of the sliding tiles, having different cards that laid over each other, Maybe you were tunneling down, there were demons, you'd flip the cards over, have um, the back of the cards have demons or monsters that would come out. You'd have to fight the monsters. Uh, we had ideas of different weights of demons, like light, medium, and heavy. Resolving a conflict, at that point, we looked at this game design concept and said, are we going too much stereotypical with this? Do we want this to be a combat game? Do we want this to be a conflict game? Not good or bad either way, but uh, once you're if, you're, if you're doing this exercise of coming up with a creative game idea, I think it's really important to say like, what else could this be at every juncture? Should this be this? Should be th this be this? Or is there a different direction that this game idea can go in? So we went in a completely different directions for earthworms, roots, beetles and ants and came up with this idea of tunneling amongst the roots and eventually to this idea that we landed upon the bug labyrinth, making tunnels, pushing the tiles, going to nodes, collecting fungi, aphids, and other bug friendly stuff. So that's our game concept from potato to bug labyrinth in I guess a little more than an hour but just about an hour. And yeah, that was super fun. That was pretty intense, actually, not the direction I expected it to go into. But as with a lot of these ideas that come from the game stream, I'm kind of excited to prototype this. Now I have multiple games waiting in the wings. I have the fashion party one. I have the uh, friendly sprites trying to collect ingredients from like a potter's wheel and cast uh, moderately helpful spells like, hey, your shoelace never gets untied. And now we have this bug labyrinth game as well. So hopefully soon I'm going to figure out how to do my prototyping stream so I can take some of these concepts that you wonderful, lovely people have helped me come up with and make some actual prototypes with them because I think that would be super fun. But for now, we're doing conceptualization. You can always catch me here on Tuesdays, 4 p.m. Pacific time. I also do some other streams, playing games like Magic, and I'm going to be doing some hopefully live streaming from PAX next week if I can figure out the setup. And yeah, it's been very lovely to have you here and hope to catch you next time. Have a lovely day.